Okay, this is the digestive system. This is Rahman Rahim uh, for the anatomy and physiology block two to <coughs> pre med two double one for the spring semester 2020. This is the learning outcomes of the digestive system. By the end of the lecture, the students should be able to list the components of the digestive system, including accessory digestive organs. So hopefully we will discuss in this part one, the digestive system itself and what is the accessory part, uh, we will discuss in the part two. Then we have to describe uh, the anatomy of the oral cavity here in part one with the tongue and salivary glands and the wall of the digestive system. Then we will go one by one different parts of the digestive system like esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine and finally we will go to the blood supply of the whole. GIT means gastrointestinal tract. Okay, this is a slide mentioning the organs of the digestive system. And we can go one by one with slight introduction. The salivary glands that secretes for the lubricating uh, the bolus, right? And uh, that secretion contains the enzymes that break the, down the carbohydrate. So the start of digestion it starts from the mouth, then the pharynx, the muscular uh, tube that is used for propulsion of the material into the esophagus, propulsion pushing the bolus into the esophagus. Esophagus is the tube and through the tube the bolus passes through the stomach and stomach is the main uh, uh, part of the digestive system where the breakdown of the material takes place uh, through the acid enzyme mechanical processes through the muscular contraction, mechanical contraction is also called as small intestine enzymatic digestion absorption of water and organic material uh, vitamins and ions the large intestine large intestine uh, dehydration and compaction compaction means to make it more compact solidify right so they absorb all the water so with no more physiological aspects so all the indigested fluid material they form the fecal material then from here oral cavity teeth tongue what is the function of these these are mechanical processing, moisturing, uh, mixing, salivary secretion. So uh, this uh, teeth and oral cavity, uh, tongue, they all act like uh, a stomach because stomach, uh, they break down the material through the acids and here they break down the material through the uh, teeth. So they are mechanically uh, uh, more in action. Then liver, I got secretion. The secretion of the liver is called as the bile. And that is important for the lipid digestion, storage and nutrients of the material through vital organs. Okay, gallbladder is storage and concentration of bile, bile that is secreted by the liver. Right, always remember the secretion of the liver is called the bile. Pancreas is secretion called pancreatic juice. So, exocrines and, exo and endocrine both uh, the types of cells are present in the pancreas. So, that's why it is called a mix and gland. So, exocrine secretion that buffer uh, the acidic secretion. Uh, in the duodenum and the digestion enzymes, they also uh, use for digestion. Endocrine cells secrete hormones also. So hormones like insulin and glucagon, somatostatin. Now in the next slide, uh, there are some general concepts for the digestive system. Abdomen is a cylindrical chamber extending from the inferior aspect of thorax to superior margin of the pelvis. Abdomen and pelvic cavities are continuous. There is no uh, wall, there is no septum like diaphragm between the thorax and the abdomen. Abdominal, pel abdominal pelvic space is called as a peritoneal cavity. So, if the, it is a whole continuous space, abdomen and the pelvis. Pelvis is a space that is uh, uh, within the hip bone, right? Within the pelvic bone, right? So, that is the pelvic uh, structures and pelvic cavity. And the abdomen is above the pelvis. Then abdominal viscera are also suspended within the peritoneum. So all the things that are there in the abdomen and peritoneum, they are by the peritoneal membrane. This layer, oral cavity, this slide, oral cavity, the buccal cavity. Buccal, in medical terminology, you have studied this. Buccal means cheek. So cavity of the mouth, the cheek cavity mouth, uh, uh, extends from the lip to the pharynx. So lip is this one. This is the upper lip, the cut section. And there are lower lip again in the cut section. So this is the anterior most end and the posterior end of this oral cavity is this opening that opens into the uh, pharynx and that part of the pharynx called the oropharynx right, because it is in relation to the oral cavity. 
it is divided into two parts so vestibule vestibular part and the second part is uh, the mouth cavity proper vestibule is the space between the lip and the cheek can you see this is small space uh, between the teeth and the lip so the space that is between the lip here in the lower lip and the teeth this space is called as the vestibule and this space is not only here along with the anterior part this space between teeth and the upper lip but it is circulating all along the teeth and the cheek so on the lateral side it is the cheek muscle so between the cheek muscle and the teeth the space that is like here very small slit like space that is space on both upper and lower jaw that is called the vestibule it communicates with the mouth proper behind the third molar tooth okay mouth proper is what mouth pro cavity proper it extends from teeth in front to the root of the tongue behind so what is remaining where the tongue is located so from one teeth to the another teeth means the right sided row of the teeth and the left sided row of the teeth the whole space the whole space between the two sided teeth that whole space that also contain the tongue and the cavity that is called as the mouth cavity proper right and here both these cavity vestibular space and this mouth cavity proper they connect they communicate with the behind the third molar tooth now this is the teeth row the molars are at the end the last third molar in the adult behind that one there is a small space right so this space this is the area that communicates between the teeth and the cheek and the teeth and the teeth the oral cavity proper right row of the teeth and the left side of the teeth so behind the third molar there is a space there is a communication between the vestibular space and the oral cavity proper then we have got the boundaries boundaries of the oral cavity superior roof hard palate anterior and soft palate hard palate this is a cut section this is the roof of the oral cavity and this is also called the floor of the nasal cavity because what is above this palate it is the nasal cavity so this form the floor of the nasal cavity and this form the roof of the oral cavity now this if you in the cut section you can see that this is the bony part maxilla right and if you go backward this is the muscular part the muscular part is called as the soft palate and the bony part is called as the hard palate so this form the roof then come to the anterior and lateral wall of the oral cavity cheek this muscle cheek muscle the buccinator muscle they usually form the lateral wall of the uh, oral cavity and anteriorly we have got the lips upper lip and lower lip and what is the name of this muscle that form the upper and lower lip that surround the oral cavity the opening of the mouth that muscle is the orbicularis oris then come to the posterior is the uvula palatine tonsils and the root of the tongue now these are three structure this is the oral cavity the posterior part where there is a opening that opens into the pharynx the oral pharynx name this structure this is the soft palate this gland this is the palatine tonsil the lymphoid tissue and this this structure is what this is the tongue right this hole is the tongue actually tongue is a muscular part and this is covered by the mucous membrane and this is the posterior part so the posterior of the oral cavity proper is bounded by the now this soft palate if you see it from the front you will find the center hanging muscle that is called the uvula so this central part uh, that is hanging in the center when you open up your mouth and look into the mirror the posteriorly you will find a hanging central muscle that is called the uvula so that muscle is also the part of the soft palate then this tonsil and this is the root of the tongue right so tongue starts from here anterior to the epiglottis so this is the root of the tongue that is the identification is that these root they contain big papilla so they are rough and the anterior one is smooth 
so this is the root of the papilla that also form the posterior now inferior tongue skeletal muscle now that was the roof that was the lateral wall anterior posterior now come to the roof this tongue is one of the content of the oral cavity regarding the floor these are the muscles here there are two muscles this is a mylohyoid muscle and this is a genohyoid muscle so these are the uh, tongue and skeletal muscle so this tongue from here this is a genoglossus muscle this is the genohyoid muscle this is a hyoid bone this is the mandible the inner surface of the mandible has got the genial tubercles right so these are the two uh, the attachment for the genohyoid right so hyoid and the genial tubercle on the inner surface of the mandible and lower down this is another muscle this is called the mylohyoid right so they form the, the tongue <coughs> and these muscle genohyoid and mylohyoid they form the floor or the inferior wall of the oral cavity okay next slide we have the tongue tongue this is the superior view of the tongue right as we have discussed this is the superior view of the tongue right this is the epiglottis at the back and this is the root of the tongue rough part that is showing so many papillae right so this papilla mentioned the root and the anterior two third uh, is the smooth part okay how we divide the tongue can you see this uh, victory like we inverted this this line this line is called sulcus sulcus means depression terminalis at the end so at the end here of the tongue we have got a depression and this is a depression called as sulcus terminalis so anterior to this sulcus terminalis this comprises the two third of the tongue so this is the anterior part so anterior two third of the tongue and behind this one is one third the root of the tongue so this is called as the posterior one third anterior two third posterior one third divided by sulcus terminalis right the tongue is a mass of striated muscle covered by mucous membrane as in the cut section uh, we have seen uh, the tongue comprising of so many muscles right uh, and here regarding the muscles you can see that they are one two three four all the muscles that are named with the glossus in the end like genioglossus uh, hyoglossus styloglossus so these glosses these are the main muscles right there is another muscle called as genohyoid so this is the genohyoid this is the genoglossus right look at the lining geno glossus geno hyoid this one styloid process is here so stylo glossus right this is a tongue so stylo glossus and then this green color muscle this is the hyoid bone uh, long horn so this green color is a broad one so this is hyoglossus so hyoglossus stylo glossus geno glossus and this is geno hyoid so they are supposed to be the muscles of the uh, tongue these are called as the extrinsic muscles of the tongue there are some intrinsic muscles that are only inside so vertical horizontal and transverse these are the three intrinsic muscles that are present only inside the they are arising and uh, finishing inside the tongue they are not coming from outside since they are coming from outside of the tongue so they are called as the extrinsic muscles of the tongue now the tongue is a mass of striated muscles covered by mucous membrane okay this is the mucous membrane with papilla papilla they usually contain the taste taste buds inside right now come to the mucous membrane mucous membrane upper surface of the tongue can be divided into anterior two third or oral part and the posterior one third or pharyngeal part by a v-shaped sulcus the sulcus tongue now this is more towards the pharynx so this one the posterior one third the posterior one third or pharyngeal part so it is facing toward the pharynx so it is called pharyngeal part and this anterior two third it is facing the oral cavity so anterior two third or the oral part so oral part or anterior two third 
pharyngeal part or posterior one third of the tongue. Now, come to the sensory nerve supply. The nerve supply to the mucous membrane. Now, here we have divided anterior two third and posterior one third. Which part? Not the muscle. We have divided the mucous membrane because this is the highest membrane that is covering the surface of the tongue, right? So, below this membrane, this mucous membrane, we have got the muscles. Now, we are talking about the mucous membrane, not the muscles. Muscles of the, of the, of the oral cavity, they are innervated by which cranial nerve? The 12th cranial nerve, that is called the hypoglossal nerve, right? Except one. So, here again, now we are dividing this is mucous membrane that is covering the muscles of the tongue, right? This mucous membrane is sensory. So here we are discussing all about the sensory innervation, right? So sensory, all the sensation from the anterior two-third of the oral part, this one. Now, sensation, general sensation and special sensation. When we call about the general sensation, general sensation include the pain, touch, temperature, pressure, all like this, right? So those general sensations, they are carried through the, which branch of the nerve? Lingual nerve. And this lingual nerve is a branch of the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve, right? So trigeminal nerve, it is called tri because it has got three main divisions of thalamic, maxillary and mandibular. So the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve give a branch called as the lingual nerve and that lingual nerve carries the general sensation from the anterior to third, that is the oral part of the tongue, right? Now come to the posterior one third. Oh, sorry. This so the general sensation is carried through the uh, lingual nerve. Now come to the anterior two third again. But special sensation. Special sensation for the tongue is what taste. So taste is a special sense. It, it it is sensed by the taste buds. So taste buds they are usually uh, present uh, in the depression of the papilla. So these are called papilla, right? They are big one. They are again bigger, valid papilla, and there are some valvate, valid papilla. It's very small here. Can you see this dot, 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 dot? So they are very numerous. So those papilla, they are very small comparing to this big one. Big ones are uh, very visible. So these papilla, uh, in their depression, they contain the taste buds. So now, special sensation from the anterior two third of the oral part of the tongue. It is carried through the corda tympani. Okay. Corda tympani is a branch of the facial nerve. So facial nerve that supplies the muscles of the face, right? Facial expression muscles. Uh, Zygomatics major, minor, uh, orbicularis oris, uh, orbicularis oculi, right? Nasalis. So the same facial nerve, it gives a branch, but it takes the so facial nerve itself is a mixed nerve, motor and sensory. So motor part supplies the muscles of the face and the sensory part is carrying special sensation through which branch? Corda tendula. This is the name of the nerve. Now come to the posterior part. Posterior part again, general sensation and special sensation. Both means in this posterior one third, the taste buds that will give the special sensation. So both are carried, both the general and special, they are carried by the glossopharyngeal nerve, that is the ninth cranial nerve. Motor nerve supply to the muscles of the tongue. Now, this is the mucous membrane. When you remove this mucous membrane, inferiorly, you will find these muscles, right? So these muscles, now they are, when you innervate the muscles, they are called the motor nerves, right? So motor nerve supply the muscles of the tongue and is from the hypoglossal. So which one is the hypoglossal? come to the next uh, slide in the next slide we have uh, we will discuss different glands and in the glands we have got salivary glands uh, and in the salivary glands so the saliva the secretion that lubricates and soften the uh, bolus what you eat and is then chewed easily so those salivary secretory glands, they are exocrine glands and every exocrine glands, they have got a duct, right? So when we say the exocrine gland, so all are usually the 
exocrine glands, parotid, submandibular, sublingual, right? So they have all of them, they have got the ducts. Now, are the salivary glands open and secrete into the oral cavity? Minor salivary glands are located throughout the submucosa of the oral. They are minor and these glands, they are called the major. Major means larger, big one. These are the glands. And they are minor salivary glands. They are just below the mucous membrane of the oral cavity inside. Now, come to one by one, the major one, the uh, largest salivary gland, parotid gland. Largest salivary gland and on the lateral side of the face, so this is the face, this is the lateral side, it is opened up just to show you this. The skin is removed and below the skin and below the ear, in front of the ear, right? And taro inferior, you will find this pyramidal shaped triangular parotid gland. And you can see from the parotid gland, can you see this green color duct? This green color duct, this is called the parotid duct, right? And this duct opens to the oral cavity. Where in the oral cavity? In the vestibular area in the cheek and you can see this is showing the opening of the parotid duct so this parotid duct it pierces the buccinator muscle because the buccinator muscle uh, this is the cheek muscle so this duct actually runs on the masseter which muscle is this this is the masseter and then it it pierces this buccinator and opens over here now parotid gland largest salivary glands lateral side it's composed mostly of serous SNI. serous SNI means water and electrolyte and enzymes right they are not for the lipid uh, secreting function its duct empties in the vestibule of the mouth opposite to the second upper molar tooth not the lower motor molar tooth not the first not the third second upper second molar tooth now come to this slavery glands so we have discussed the uh, parotid gland now come to the other two glands. Other two glands are submandibular gland. Submandibular means below the mandible. So where is the mandible? Mandible is the, this cut part, right? So this cut part below this mandible, this is continuous here. This is the parotid gland, right? We have discussed and we have discussed the parotid duct. Here is the buccinator. It runs on the masseter. It does not penetrate the masseter. It runs on the masseter but it penetrate, it puncture the buccinator, right? And opens into upper second motor. Now, second muscle, um, gland is submandibular. Submandibular gland is this one. Below the mandible is here. It's appearing as small here, right? What it is, it's got two parts. Submandibular glands. And where is the duct? Here is the duct. And this duct is passing medial to this gland. And can you see this, this duct continuous here? So there's a submandibular duct and this is continuous here. So this is the duct, one single duct. There is submandibular duct and this it opens just below the tongue. So below the tongue you will find here the sublingual fold indicates the position of the sublingual gland and at the end you will find the first opening in this row you will find the opening of the submandibular duct. Now, submandibular gland lies on the medial surface of the mandible, right, definitely, and it is divided into superficial and deep parts by the mylohyoid muscle. So, this is the deep part and the muscle, the mylohyoid, uh, this one that is removed from here to show the deeper part. It consists of a mixture of serous and mucous SNI. Serous, water electrolyte enzyme, mucus, lipids, right, it secretes both the types of secretions. It's a duct drain into the floor of the mouth near the lingual frenulum, posterior to the lower molars. Near the lingual frenulum. What is frenulum? This is the frenulum, the, the structure that attaches the lower surface of the tongue with the floor of the oral cavity, right? So this is called the frenulum. When you lift the tongue in the mirror, you can see lifting your tongue up posterior to the lower mandibles okay <clears throat> lower mandible here you will find it then we have got the sublingual sublingual as the name is indicating it is below the tongue the smallest salivary gland it has both serous and mucus same like uh, submandibular but the parotid only contains the serous SNI are the uh, the lowest part the glandular part of the gland there's a ductal part and the gland with a later predominating 
uh, it is drained later predominating means serous and mucus so some later the mu dominant part of the sublingual gland is mucus means in lubrication fats fatty droplets it is drained by 10 small ducts which open to the floor of the mouth near the lingual frenulum now find the 10 so 8 to 10 can this is the gland this is the sublingual gland and you can see this is small many gland, small ducts 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 so 8 to 10 usually it's written so here 8 small ducts so these is 8 small ducts they individually they open on the side of the frenulum this so this is the side where the first opening is the opening of the sublingual gland submandibular gland and the remaining opening here there are eight openings right they will show you so these are the openings of these eight ductal uh, sublingual glands now come to this part this is the wall of the gastrointestinal tract wall of the gastrointestinal tract composed of four layers mucosa submucosa muscularis mucosa and serosa serosa is basically the peritoneal layer the outer covering the outer peritoneum so now this is a slide that is mentioning the different uh, layers of the wall of the gastrointestinal tract GIT so one two three four layers the fourth layer the serosa we start from the outside uh, can you see this covering so this covering here it is written serosa with connected tissue and the epithelium this serosa is actually the peritoneum right so any structure that is all enveloped circled by this peritoneum that is called intraperitoneal right and in the abdomen organs they are surrounded by and then the two layers of the peritoneum they unite together and that become the passage for the entry of the artery veins nerves lymphatics into that organ so this organ just like the hilum uh, the concept of hilum is that the area the surface area uh, through which all the vessels and structures they penetrate the organ and come out from that area same is true here when any peritoneum that is covering the organ that area where the two layers of the peritoneum after encircling they join together that double layer of peritoneum that is called as the mesentery and what is the purpose of this this also helps in the passage of the arteries nerves veins all into the to the organ right so this is the serosa so serosa is actually now what epithelium is this peritoneum is a mesothelium and all the mesothelium they are simple squamous epithelium right so which type of epithelium simple squamous now after outside come to the easy layers the mucosa now mucosa uh, this is the innermost layer right and in the innermost layer you will find that this innermost layer is further divided into epithelium lamina propria and muscularis mucosa so muscularis is this muscularis is third layer muscularis means any muscle layer right so this muscle layer is the muscle layer of the mucosa that's why it is called muscularis of the mucosa and this is only mus muscularis means it is something only the muscular layer the proper muscular layer and when is the muscle of the mucosa it is called muscularis mucosa now where is, are all these so first of all you will find this is the mucosa here and mucosa has got the epithelium so this innermost this is the lumen of the uh, tube whether it's a tube of esophagus or the cavity of the stomach or cavity of the small intestine or cavity of the large intestine so this is the innermost <coughs> layer the epithelium uh, which type of epithelium is this in the GIT simple columnar epithelium right then below the epithelium can you see okay can you see these small glands from the surface epithelium these are the glands so these glands are called the glands of the mucosa uh, they are very small one and they are also present in the oral cavity or below the uh, mucous membrane so this is the gland of the mucosa now after this epithelium simple cuboidal epithelium and the glands 
you find lamina propria this white color this white area is called lamina propria so lamina propria is a connective tissue layer right with a loose connective tissue layer loose connective tissue layer right and in the loose connective tissue layer you may find mucosa associated lymphoid tissue malt so malt its location is in the lamina propria <coughs> then after this lamina propria loose connective tissue uh, because this loose connective tissue also provide the arteries small arteries and veins right because you know in the epithelium epithelium is avascular there is no blood vessel here so below the epithelium there must be some blood vessel so that they can give uh, nutrition to the epithelial cells that they don't die and they also divide and grow so this lamina propria is loose containing blood vessels small blood vessels okay arteries vein nerves muscularis mucosa this is the outermost muscle so this is the third part of the mucosa you can see this muscle so this is the muscle same muscle just like here right but these are thick they are <coughs> broad muscular band and these are small stripe of muscle a single small stripe they are very thin but this is a muscle right which type of muscle in the organs you find the smooth muscles right so these three layers they in combined form they are this is called as mucosa so first layer epithelium lamina propria loose connective tissue containing blood vessels arteries nerve veins and some uh, glands plus malt lymphoid tissues right then after mucosa we have got the muscular sub mucosa sub mucosa means below the mucosa so below these three layers so after these three layers you will find another layer this white color area this is below the uh, mucosa right so whenever we say the mucosa of the digestive system we mean these three layers right and below these three layers this is the sub mucosa now in the sub mucosa you will also find this gland so glands of the sub mucosa so in the sub mucosa in different parts of the digestive system there are different glands right <clears throat> so these are the glands you can see this the duct that is opening into the lumen but the duct is only piercing the mucosa all the three layers of the mucosa but the gland itself is present in the sub mucosa this is very very important to know that the gland itself they are usually the popular glands they are present in the sub mucosa but the duct it penetrate it moves up and penetrate the three layers of the mucosa and open into the uh, lumen now sub mucosa also you can see this artery veins nerves so this is again so these arteries vein nerves they are also uh, present in the sub mucosa then muscularis muscularis the muscle here is this layer is only composed of muscles right and there are two types of muscles can you see the difference between the two layers of the muscles this muscle is circular muscle right the inner one so inner one is almost always a circular muscle right and the outer one is almost always a longitudinal one this is long right the fiber direction is long and here the fiber direction is circular right so inner circular outer longitudinal muscle so this is a muscularis uh, external sometimes this muscle to differentiate is logically uh, this layer is called as muscularis externa and this muscle layer that is thin the part of the mucosa is called muscularis interna right so these are the layers of the uh, wall of the digestive system in the next slide wall of the digestive system four layers mucosa is consisting of so again mucosa consisting of uh, three layers inner epithelial lining that vary with location from the uh, esophagus to the anus we have got the simple columnar epithelium right uh, lamina propria is a layer of areolar connective tissue means loose connective tissue or with uh, it can be compressed easily under the epithelium below the epithelium muscularis mucosa is a thin layer of smooth muscle next to the lamina propria below the lamina propria then after mucosa we have got the submucosa submucosa layer is a dense irregular connective tissue now which type of connective tissue is this submucosa okay it is loose connective tissue but it is a connective tissue but it is dense irregular connective tissue 
So what is the another example of dense irregular connective tissue? The dermis of the skin, right? Dense irregular connective tissue. And for the regular tendon, okay, that's uh, this dense irregular connective tissue that surrounds the mucosa. So this is the mucosa three layer. It surrounds. This is the submucosa, dense irregular connective tissue that contains the blood vessels, nerves, uh, Meissner's plexus. Meissner was the scientist who discovered this thing. So the nerve, nervous plexus, if you see in this submucosa, this uh, yellow colored nerve branches, these are plexus, the nervous plexus. So this mucosa, since it is present inside the submucosal layer, so this plexus is called as submucosal plexus or plexus of Meissner's. So Meissner's plexus, scientist name, but according to location, we can say it as submucosal plexus, right? Because there is another plexus. Then what else in the submucosal layer? Lymphatic vessels, glands. Then coming to the then coming to the muscular external. Muscular is external. Look here, uh, muscularis mucosa. That is also called muscularis interna. In differentiating that this muscularis is not the muscularis mucosa, they named it as muscularis externa. So in so many books, this muscularis, this layer is called muscularis externa. So this muscularis layer or muscularis external layer, it has got circular, inner circular, outer longitudinal muscle layer. Inner circular squeezes the <coughs> duct. Definitely when circular muscle contract, it squeezes, it compresses the content hardly. And the outer longitudinal muscle, shortens the gut for movement of the material so peristaltic movement for peristaltic movement uh, both of them is a combined effect the longitudinal one is actually for pushing and circular for crushing is present between these muscles it's a myenteric plexus nerve plexus just like Meissner's nerve plexus was present in the in which layer submucosa so in the muscularis uh, myenteric nervous plexus myenteric Myo means muscles, enter means intestine. So muscle of the intestine, if you see, if you remove these two muscles, can you see this nervous plexus? This is the nerve, this is the nerve, right? So this nerve and inside nerve, above the longitudinal muscle and sandwich between the circular and the longitudinal muscle. This nervous plexus, both of them, they are called as the myenteric plexus by the name of Orbeck. Orbeck plexus of Orbeck, Orbeck plexus, right? So myenteric right. plexus or Orbeck plexus. In the exam, they can ask you in both the ways. Cirrhosa, visceral peritoneum. Peritoneum, I told you, just like per pleura, pericardia, it is double layer. The inner layer that covers the organ, it's called visceral layer, and the outer that covers the wall, peritoneum, or parietal layer. So this cirrhosa is actually this cirrhosa is actually the visceral peritoneum that covers the muscularis externa along most of the digestive system or tract. Come to the next slide. Next slide is showing you the esophagus, right? So esophagus, we have another thing. So in the esophagus, we have again the esophageal is a muscular tube, it is a tube but it is composed of muscles, right? Connects pharynx to the stomach, major portion of the esophagus lies in neck and thorax. Definitely esophagus, it is connected from the uh, pharyngeal area and it goes, passes through the thorax and enter into the abdomen. So major portion of the esophagus lies in the neck and the thorax, a very small portion enters into the abdomen and immediately connect to the stomach. That's muscularis. Superior third of the stomach of the esophagus is skeletal. Lower two third is the smooth muscle. Now here if you see, this is the oral cavity, pharynx, right? And this very long esophagus and there's the stomach. Now this tube that is posterior to the trachea, posterior to the larynx, posterior to the trachea, this is the esophagus. Now, and if you look here, what it is saying, it is saying upper 5% is voluntary skeletal muscle. This muscular tube, upper 5% is purely 100% uh, 
skeletal muscle and if you see distal 50% involuntary purely smooth muscles right so lower 50% is smooth muscle upper 50% is divided as upper 5% purely 100% skeletal but after 5% this 45% of the upper half uh, it is a mix so skeletal muscle and smooth muscles both are mixed in this middle portion now this esophagus pierces the diaphragm at thoracic 10th level to enter into the abdomen so can you say this is a stomach it has to connect its stomach is in the abdomen and abdomen is below the diaphragm this line is indicating a diaphragm so in the diaphragm there is an opening for the esophagus so at which thoracic level 10th thoracic vertebra so we always take with the vertebra right so usually take right so t2 t10 10 thoracic vertebral level there is an opening in the diaphragm through which the esophagus passes into the abdomen come to the blood supply of the esophagus arteries inferior thyroid artery and left gastric artery inferior thyroid artery then you see here there is the arch of aorta aorta and there is the esophagus right so this esophagus is a very long tube so it's not only supplied by one artery but there are three contributing arteries the upper part is supplied by the inferior thyroid artery the middle part are supplied by the branches of the bronchial artery and the aortic esophageal branches not the bronchial one aortic esophageal branches right so inferior thyroid artery the upper part middle part is usually mainly supplied by the esophageal branches coming from the aorta right and the lower part that is in the abdominal area right particularly they are innervated by the branches of the left gastric artery gastric artery to right and left so left gastric artery it gives branches that are called the esophageal branches of the left gastric artery they supply the inferior one third so upper one third middle one third and lower one third so lower one third is usually supplied by the esophageal branches of the left gastric artery now come to the stomach stomach uh, we have got the stomach lies in the epigastrium lies in the epigastric umbilical and left hypochondriac region so in these three regions you will find the, uh, in the quadrants of the abdomen you will find the stomach so it has four main regions cardiac cardiac region means towards the cardiac towards the heart surround the superior opening of the stomach so this is the superior part this is the esophagus so this opening the cardiac orifice of the stomach so this region that surround this opening that is the cardiac uh, region then we have got the fundus fundus is very tricky make a horizontal line from the opening of the stomach right the cardiac end from the cardiac end make a horizontal line the area that is above this line that is a dome shape right so that area is called as the fundus and is superior to the cardiac orifice of the stomach then we have got the body of the uh, stomach body of the stomach below this horizontal line this is a very big body till there is a line here now anatomically we say that this line is actually a vertical line in the anatomical position of the stomach draw a vertical line from the point of this angle this angle is called angular angularis incisura right, in latin and it is angular incisio so angular incisio is this bending actually here this is vertical border and this is the horizontal border so this is a, an angle between vertical and the horizontal so this angle is actually called as the angle angularis incisura right and from this angle if you drop a vertical line means perfectly it is a vertical line right that vertical line will divide the body and the anterior part right pyloric part so this here in this picture okay fine this is looking more beautiful so it is a slight curve so this very big portion is the body of the so the lower limit of the body is an imaginary line running down from the angular incisiva this is the main portion of the stomach it extends from the cardiac opening to the angular notch from the cardiac opening from here right 
so this over here below the fundus and up to the uh, angular notch angular notch is this so draw a line from angular notch this area this whole area is the body of this then we have got the pylorus pylorus is what beyond the this line or anterior to this line that you are drawn from the angular insula this all area is called pylorus right but this pylorus has again two parts pyloric antrum and pyloric canal the feature the internal feature of the pyloric canal is that you can find ruggies ruggies that are parallel with one another here but the same ruggies are also present in all the other part of the stomach but they are not parallel to each other but they are haphazardly present so this haphazardness part of the pylorus containing haphazardly placed ruggies uh, those are called pyloric antrum and pyloric canal is very parallel ruggies are here and they all go to the opening of the pylorus right so it is divided into pyloric antrum and pyloric canal the pyloric canal opens to the duodenum so this pyloric canal opens to the pylorus pyloric orifice orifice means opening now this is the slide for the pyloric sphincter what is the concept of sphincter the concept of sphincter is any circular muscle in the in the long tube that closes the tube so here this is the esophagus very long one and here there is one sphincter for the lower esophageal sphincter similarly there is a uh, upper esophageal sphincters they are not discussed similarly in the stomach this is the upper sphincter here and this is the lower sphincter and sphincters they are the circular smooth muscles forming an opening so when it contracts it closes the opening and when it relaxes it opens the opening so pyloric opening opens into the duodenum so this is the duodenal part start of the small intestine the first part of the small intestine and this is the stomach so between their junction we have got the sphincter and is surrounded by pyloric sphincter which is a layer of thick and circular smooth muscles it controls the rate of emptying of stomach contents into the duodenum so what is the role of this when the contents are not broken this sphincter will close remains closed right when it, it form a paste of the uh, form of the paste that is called as the chyle so then only this will open and it will allow that paste to go into the small intestine for absorption because small intestine don't have the um, mechanical action to break down the foods they, the basic purpose is to absorb the food right the stomach has two curvatures the medial border with the lesser curvature and the lateral border oh, that is convex or the greater curvature now this is the stomach can you see the two borders the one border this upper border and there is a lower border right from this opening cardiac opening to all this area this is a very big one so this is a very big curve so this that's why it's called greater curve and there is a smaller curve that is a lesser curve here right on the upper side so there is a smaller curvature and there is a greater curvature it has two surfaces anterior and posterior so when it is complete full stomach this is the we are looking at the anterior side and here you can see this ruggy ruggy i was talking about this ruggies they are very haphazardly placed till it become very parallel here in the pyloric uh, antrum pyloric canal not the antrum antrum is this part where the they are not in parallel okay then we have got this slide blood supply of the uh, stomach branch is the celiac trunk where is the celiac trunk so you will find this is the aorta in the abdomen and <clears throat> celiac trunk is this at the level of uh, t12 and this celiac trunk then gives off branches the left and ref, left and right gastric branches so left and right gastric branches celiac trunk this is a trunk divides into three common hepatic splenic and this is the left gastric so left gastric is visible here it is going to the left side of the body and then make a turn and from that turn it runs on the lesser curvature of the stomach right so from here this is the left uh, gastric artery and the <clears throat> left and right gastric arteries so left gastric artery and the right gastric artery 
is this one. So this one, right gastric artery, is a branch of the uh, common hepatic artery. Right and left gastroepiploic artery. So right and left gastroepiploic artery means now this is the celiac trunk, left gastric artery running on the lesser curvature. Always remember that splenic artery. This is a very good splenic artery going towards which structure? Spleen. What is this structure? This is the spleen where the tail of the pancreas touches, right? So this is a splenic artery. But splenic artery, apart from giving the spleen, the blood vessels, it make a big branch. It gives a big branch that is called the left gastroepiploic artery. So left gastroepiploic artery is actually a branch of the splenic artery. And left, left gastroepiploic artery, it runs on which curvature? Which curvature is this? Greater curvature. So left gastroepiploic artery is a branch of the splenic artery that runs in the greater curvature of the stomach. Right? Then we have got short gastric artery. Short gastric arteries are these. The same splenic artery, it gives blood supply to the spleen. It gives a big branch, left gastroepiploic artery. And then it gives short branches, this. This short branches that is going to the fundus. So what is the blood supply to the fundus of the uh, stomach? It is supplied by the short branches, right? Short gastric arteries that supplies the fundus, right? So this is very important. Then we have got the veins. Veins correspond to the arteries drain into the portal veins. So ultimately there is a vein, venous system that ultimately drains the portal We'll discuss the portal vein in the end. Then we have got this slide and this slide for the duodenum and duodenum has got three parts and first part uh, the small intestine actually is divided into three parts duodenum, jejunum, ileum. The duodenum that is the first part of the small intestine it is 25 centimeter long right and it is the shortest widest uh, it is shortest, widest, and most fixed part of the small intestine. So most fixed part of the duodenum and most fixed part of the small intestine, both. Most of the duodenum is retroperitoneal. Most of the retroperitoneal means behind the peritoneum, means it is not fully enveloped by the peritoneum. So it starts at the pyloric sphincter of the stomach and ends by joining the jejunum. So this is the duodenum, this is the lower part, the pyloric antrum of the stomach. And from the stomach, the pyloric sphincter is here. From here onward, this is the first part of the duodenum. This is the second part of the duodenum, third part of the duodenum, fourth part of the duodenum. And this kinking, this is the start of the jejunum, right? So there are four parts of the duodenum, right? Another point, this duodenum is C-shaped tube, surrounds the head of the pancreas. So this... In this picture, this is the pancreas, this is the spleen, tail of the pancreas touches the spleen and the head of the pancreas touches the duodenum. So duodenum has got four parts, first, second, third, fourth. But if you see these four parts of the duodenum, they are according to their uh, location, they can be uh, uh, superior, these are descending and then this is the uh, transverse or horizontal and this is ascending. So first part is the superior most part of the duodenum. Then this one, this is more vertical. So it is called the descending. Descending, second part, right? Then is a transverse, horizontal. And then there is ascending the fourth part of the duodenum. Okay, this is the small intestine. Again, continuation. Uh, now after that, that duodenum, 25 centimeters we have got jejunum that is 2.5 meters means it is uh, almost 2.8.2 uh, feet long and this one is uh, intraperitoneal so intraperitoneal uh, means inside the peritoneum uh, usually the small intestine uh, duodenum jejunum this jejunal part is intraperitoneal completely right Many lie in the upper part of the abdominal cavity. Numerous plica circularis and abundant long villi. Now, this is very important slide, and this is very tricky and very important and very lovely slide actually. For any anatomist and for any the subject lover, they will love this because here this is also describing some histology part of the how you differentiate between the duodenum 
jejunum and ilium. In the duodenum, we have discussed uh, uh, that uh, it has got four parts and this and that. But in the cut section, what is very important is the presence of the duodenal gland that is called the Brunner's gland. Brunner's gland, uh, the, by the name of the scientist Brunner, that is a duodenal gland, is present in the submucosa. Right? How many layers are this? Mucosa, submucosa, muscularis, externa, and serosa. Now, this mucosa has got three parts epithelium, right? The simple columnar epithelium. Then below this uh, white line, white area, this is the lamina propria. And this border, this line, this line is actually the stripe of a smooth muscle. That is the smooth muscle of the mucosa. So it is called the muscularis mucosa. So these are the three parts of the mucosa, right? Below the mucosa, in the submucosa, uh, this area, there is a abundant uh, lymphoid gland, uh, gland is there that is called the Brunner's gland, duodenal glands, right? Now, this is for the duodenum. Jejunum don't have the Brunner's gland, right? And jejunum has got this plica circularis as the major uh, numerous plica circularis. So, this plica circularis, what is this? This is a submucosa that is elevated. So, this submucosa is itself a finger like projection. And on this finger-like projection, there are villi that are also finger-like projection, right? So whenever the plica circularis in this tology is same, this means this is largely present, very prominent in the jejunum. And in the submucosa, and the plica circularis, uh, that is the elevation of the submucosa, in the submucosa, you will not find the Brunner's gland, right? The Brunner's gland, digestive gland, is also not present here in the jejunum. So this is the identification point. That if plica circularis is very much right without the gland, it is jejunum. If plica circularis is broad and there are in the submucosa, you will find a lot of gland. So that is the duodenum. And here, the third part is the is the ileum. Ileum is actually has got very broad, or you can say speed breaker like, right? Uh, plica circularis, very few plica circularis, tall plica circularis, right? Uh, and uh, uh, villi, they are also broad. But what is important? Aggregation of lymphoid tissue in the submucosa. In the submucosa, you will not find gland, glandular cells, glands, but you will find aggregation of T and B lymphocytes. And these aggregations, they are called the pear patches. Pear for the scientists who discovered these patches in the ileum. And these patches are actually the aggregation of B and T lymphocytes that form the aggregate of the lymphoid nodule, lymphoid follicle that we have discussed in the lymphatic uh, system. The majority of the chemical digestion uh, and the nutrition absorbed occurs through the jejunum. So jejunum is the main part of the uh, digestive system that absorbs. Now ileum or ileum, it has got 11.5 feet in length final segment of the small intestine mainly lies in the lower part of the abdominal cavity definitely this is the here is this the duodenum after his stomach then the blue color there is the jejunum and this green color is the lower most there are few plica circularis so here you will hardly find structure like this elevation of the submucosa forming the uh, very sharp mountainous structure right uh, and Stumpy villi. Stumpy means short. The villi, comparing to this one, they are very tall, and here the villi they are short, right? So short villi without plica circularis with aggregation of lymphocytes is the feature of the ileum. Submucosa contains aggregation of pear patches, provide for absorption of nutrients. Okay, ileocecal valve controls the flow of material into the cecum from the ileum. So after this ileum, ileum connects with the cecum of the large intestine. Cecum is supposed to be first part of the large intestine. So this ileocecal junction means where they are joining together. That's called the junction. So it is acting like a valve again. Now in the next slide, we have the large intestine attached to the posterior abdominal wall, right? <clears throat> large intestine is usually again, this ascending and descending colon, they are uh, retroperitoneal, right? But this transverse is intraperitoneal, sigmoid, and they are also sigmoid is also intraperitoneal. Rectum again out. 
it consists of the cecum vermiform appendix colon and rectum so what are the major part this is the last part of the ilia right and they form the ileocecal junction on the posterior side this is the appendix tail like appendix means something that is extra so appendices epiploike this is also called as a part of uh, appendix now uh, this is the first part the first swelling is called as the cecum right and then it is the ascending colon transverse colon descending colon and then there is a wave like band right this wave like band this is the uh, sigma sigma shape so this is called as the sigmoid colon and then there is a straight rectum a very straight one right so this is the rectum and last part 1 to 2 cm this is the anal canal so it consists of these parts then the colon has ascending transverse descending sigmoid ascending and transverse part are retroperitoneal and the transverse colon is intraperitoneal as we have discussed this one ascending and descending they are retroperitoneal retroperitoneal means behind the peritoneum they are not fully covered up enveloped by the peritoneum because anything that is covered up fully enveloped by the peritoneum it is hanging it is hanging by the uh, mesentery uh, at the back special feature of the colon number 1 tinea coli longitudinal muscle are thickened forming the three bands now there is a story for uh, there is a good story regarding uh, uh, this tinea coli and hostrations right tinea coli seculation seculation mean sac like uh, structure sac so you can see these are the sac like structure right so this whole large intestine is multiple sac like structure that is called seculation right anything that is segmented it is uh, sac, sac likes in sac seculation right and each sac each one sac that is called as a hostration right so so this seculation is also called as has hostrations right hostration and seculation is the same thing right seculation seculation is derived from the sac hostrations it is derived from hostrum singular and this is one single hostra right so hostra is singular that is the one sac now what is the histological uh, origin of these uh, two structures tinea coli can you see it starts from the appendix right and it runs all along the ascending transverse descending and sigmoid then after sigmoid this rectum does not have this tinea coli these long thread like structures actually these long thread like structure these tinea coli they are three in number and what actually are these um, in the wall of the digestive system the gastrointestinal tract the layer that is the muscularis or the muscularis externa that contains the inner circular and outer longitudinal this is the show of these two muscles because these two muscles after the appendix they modify themselves right what happened the outer longitudinal layer all along the large intestine up to the sigmoid right <clears throat> not the rectum what happened these outer hole covering of the longitudinal muscles they 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 concentrate in three bands right so that those three bands are actually become the outer layer outer longitudinal muscle layer so all the longitudinal muscles they converge they concentrate in three bands right so there are one band that is visible here so it is actually three so three bands they are starting from the appendix right appendix don't have these tinea coli don't change but from the appendix arises the longitudinal muscles they become three bands tinea coli and it runs up to the sigmoid but after the sigmoid when the rectum starts there is a straight structure these longitudinal bands again they disperse they spread they scatter and make the outer whole longitudinal muscle layer all around the rectum right so this is the story of the tinea coli now coming to the hostra hostra or sac secule called secule or hostra sac for seculation and hostration actually when these outer longitudinal muscle layer they condense into three bands what is exposed is the inner circular muscle and these inner circular muscles 
they appear as sac like structures they become pouches right because they don't they are not supported by the another outer layer the longitudinal at that side so what happens they bag their cells right into sac like structures so this bagging like a structure this sac like structure they form this sac so these sac if you say properly these saculations they are actually the circular smooth muscle here there is no longitudinal outer layer so inner circular is there in the saculation and tinea coli is the outer longitudinal muscles condensed in three bands so saculation sac like pouches it's a wall between the tinea uh, between the tinea called as so these hostations are between the tinea coli three tinea coli so one anterior to posterior so here we call it as so between the tinea bands these are the hostations so single is called hostra from the hostrum singular then the last feature of the large intestine is appendices epipolyki appendices means something extra something supporting right just like in the books appendices is written at the end right and epipolyki it is related to the pertaining to the omentum right so this appendix is also covered by the mesentery so this is structured when it was discovered so people call it as an extra uh, structure that is related with the omentum because it is covered by the double layer of peritoneum so there is a small pouch of peritoneum filled with the fat now next slide is regarding the rectum and in the rectum we have uh, as we have said the word rectum derived from the rectus means straight so where is the straight thing this one and in the rectum you will not find the tinea coli or the hostations because the tinea coli now is scattered and they support the inner circular layer so there is no pouching there is no sac like structure of the circular muscle and only the longitudinal muscles and outer longitudinal muscle is visible here now rectum begins with the continuation of the sigmoid colon and forms a, and lasts for 15 cm of the digestive system 15 cm is hardly more than one fifth right but this is very very important why because it ends in front of the tip of the coccyx by piercing the pelvic diaphragm and becoming continuous with the anal canal now the next part to the rectum is the anal canal right but here it is showing the exact location of the rectum where it is located it pierces the pelvic it is in front of the tip of the coccyx coccyx we can palpate the last point the last vertebra uh, of the vertebral column right so it is in front of that but right inside the pelvis and it pierces the pelvic diaphragm where is the pelvic diaphragm this is the muscle just like the diaphragm between the thorax and the abdomen there is a diaphragm between the abdomen and the perineum not the pelvis but the perineum perineum is the lower part below the the area that is below the uh, urogenital diaphragm so this is the muscle and this muscle is composed just like a, or rather just opposite to the diaphragm diaphragm between thorax and abdomen it is a singular muscle right it's composed of one muscle with a dome tendons in the center and the peripheral muscles but this levator and i uh, this urogenital diaphragm that is composed of levator several types of levator and i right so here this muscle this is the levator and i uh, this is one of the major contributor of the urogenital diaphragm urogenital diaphragm so this is called as the urogenital diaphragm the diaphragm between the uh, genitals and the urinary system so we will study later so in front of the tip of the coccyx we are piercing the pelvic diaphragm so this urogenital diaphragm is called as the pelvic diaphragm so pelvic diaphragm and become continuous with the anus so this rectum that is a straight structure it pierces this diaphragm just like the aorta and the esophagus and the uh, inferior vena cava they were piercing the uh, diaphragm between the thorax and the abdomen same here this rectum its last part also pierces the pelvic diaphragm this composed of levator and i muscles different so and then after piercing it goes to the perineal region and in the perineal region it is it become continuous as the anal canal right so anal canal is the last part so above the uh, the pelvic diaphragm 
the structure is very straight rectum and below the pelvic diaphragm it is anal canal now it is also the rectum is expandable for temporary feces storage uh, sometimes when you go to the toilet and go to the defecation you'll find <laughs> sometimes a very continuous uh, structures comes uh, come out down right so that is actually stored primarily in the uh, rectum right and continuous with the descending colon so actually this rectum is de is designed uh, to uh, capacitate to store the extra fecal material right that's why sometimes in two days three days when it is very is constipation you are not going to the toilet so it accumulate accumulate it become a very thick and it very hard to very difficult to evacuate or really, uh, get it out of the body so muscular coat the rectum is arranged in usual outer longitudinal and inner circular layer as i told you the rectum does not have the tinea coli because all the tinea coli that were condensed previously till sigma sigmoid they are now spread out and they form us now in the rectum they form a layer outer longitudinal muscle layer now after the rectum is continuous with a 4 cm long anal canal so rectum is finishing here right and this is the anal canal right this is almost 4 cm long and passes down and backward from the rectum ampulla to the anus ampulla is the distended part of the last part last distended part of the rectum is the ampulla of the rectum except during defecation its lateral wall are kept in a position anal canal he talk, it is talking about the anal canal definitely anal canal uh just like uh, the stomach it has got two sphincters and the cardiac and lower esophageal sphincter and the pyloric sphincter then there is a sphincter between the ileum and the large intestine the cecum iliocecal junction right then this large intestine when it is opening at the anus again there is a sphincter and there are two sphincter two layered sphincter one is the inner the other one is outer the inner one is voluntarily controlled it is not under your control but the outer one is voluntarily controlled because it is skeletal it is innervated by the spinal nerve so so that's why you can control your defecation you cannot defecate in the class okay. now next slide is related with the blood supply of the digestive system that is again a very important slide because the blood supply embryologically if you see this picture you can see this is the esophagus this is a developing stomach and then stomach there is a pancreas there is a spleen and after the duodenum uh, stomach there is a duodenum ileum jejunum right uh, duodenum jejunum ileum and uh, again this is the ileum part and after that can you see this bulge small bulge this is the cecum cecum is the point that it means that this is the start of the large intestine so before that this is all a small intestine and after that this is a large intestine right now coming to the uh, point now can you see this artery this is the aorta and this is the picture of the when the fetal is developing in the in the mother womb right uterus now this aorta give three main branches 1 2 3 the upper one there is called a celiac artery the middle one is called superior mesenteric artery and the lower one is called inferior mesenteric artery if you understand the embryological distribution of the blood vessels then you can understand the gross uh, anatomical distribution of the arteries now here we can say cecal ce uh, celiac artery this is reserved for the fore gut superior mesenteric artery is reserved for mid gut inferior mesenteric artery is reserved for hind gut now we know gut gastrointestinal tract is a tube like whole structure from oropharynx esophagus to the anus a tube like structure now from where to where it is called forebrain from where to where it is called midbrain and from where to where it is called hindbrain just like in the brain forebrain midbrain hindbrain here is also a demarcation the forebrain starts from the lower part of the esophagus right and it ends where the main pancreatic duct it penetrate the second part of the duodenum this is the exact point where it is the demarcation is that before this penetrance this opening of the pancreatic duct common bile duct into the second part of the duodenum above that that is all the forebrain and below that point 
is the start of the midbrain. Oh, sorry, uh, above is the fore gut and lower is the mid gut. And this mid gut here in the picture, if you could trace it, esophagus, duodenum, and duodenum is here. So somewhere here there is the pancreas, pancreas, and pancreas is opening somewhere here in the pancreatic common bile duct, right? Now up till here, this is all fore gut. Right means before, and from here, the penetrance of the pancreatic common bile duct into the second part of the duodenum. From that onward, the mid gut. So you can trace this mid gut here. This is very important to understand for the whole life. Right? This is the mid gut. Uh, mid gut starts from the uh, lower part, from the penetrance of the, the common bile duct uh, in the duodenum, second part. Right. So third part, fourth part is the uh, part of the duodenum that is in the mid mid gut. And the first part and the second part till that point of penetrance, this is in the foregut, right? So from this third part and fourth part of the duodenum, then the jejunum hole, and then the whole ileum, and then can you see this <coughs> uh, this uh, artery? This artery that is supplying this area this is a superior mesenteric artery. So the purpose of describing this foregut, midgut, and hindgut is that there are three arteries supplying the foregut, midgut, and hindgut. The foregut is supplied all by the celiac artery, midgut is supplied by the superior mesenteric artery, and the hindgut is supplied by the inferior mesenteric artery. Now, if you trace this superior mesenteric artery, it is branching in this third and fourth part of the duodenum, right? And then jejunum, whole of the jejunum, then the whole of the ileum, right? And this branch also giving the start of the large intestine, the cecum, the appendix, the ascending colon, and then it ends up here in the transverse colon. So in the transverse colon, it supplies only the proximal two-third of the transverse colon. And then the distal one-third of the transverse colon, and later on the sigmoid colon and all the descending colon, sigmoid colon, rectum, they're all supplied by the inferior mesenteric artery. So come this story with a slide foregut from esophagus to second part of the duodenum. Why second part? The point where the common bile duct and the main pancreatic duct they penetrate in the major duodenal papilla inside the second part of the duodenum. So this include also the liver. The foregut also include the liver accessory structures, pancreas, spleen, and they are all supplied by the celiac artery or celiac trunk, right? Celiac trunk, wherever the trunk, just like pulmonary trunk, it divides into branches. Celiac trunk, it will divide into three branches. Celiac trunk is a very short, arises from the abdominal aorta at the level of the 12th thoracic vertebra. This is important. It has three terminal branches. Yes, because this celiac trunk arising at the T12 level, it divides into three branches. Now here, this is the celiac trunk arise, a very short one. But as it arises, it divides into three branches. One going to the right, the other one goes to the left, the other one going also to the left. Now, first, this branch is called left gastric artery. This one is called splenic artery. And this one is called common hepatic artery. So these are the three main branches of the celiac trunk supplying the lower part of the esophagus, whole of the stomach, the duodenum, upper two, and the spleen and the liver or it supply all part of the foregut, right? So you should know which structures are included in the foregut. So in the foregut, we have got lower part of the esophagus, stomach, first two part of the duodenum, then accessory glands, pancreas, and the spleen, the liver, they're all supplied by the celiac artery. Now, there's the next slide related with the blood supply of the digestive system. So here we can see that there's the midgut and you can see the midgut is mainly supplied by the superior mesenteric artery and this is the superior mesenteric artery and the first branch of the superior mesenteric artery is the inferior pancreatic or duodenal artery that supplies the pancreas, the head of the pancreas and the duodenum. As later on it moves ahead, it gives branches to the jejunum and then you can see this is the ileum, this is the ileum part, right? And then it also gives a branch to the appendix, appendicular artery, then the cecum, ascending colon, and then it will go and stop at the transverse colon. But that transverse colon is divided into three half, three or uh, one thirds. 
So the proximal two third of the transverse colon it is supplied by the branches of the superior mesenteric artery and not by any other, right? So this is the last point where the superior mesenteric artery supplies the blood. So this superior mesenteric artery ends up here. So second part of the deuterium. Now the start of the uh, superior mesentery it is starting from below the point where the common uh, bile duct and the pancreatic duct they penetrate the wall of the second part of the duodenum uh, at the major duodenal papilla from inside right so this major duodenal papilla is actually the division the cut point between the fore gut and the mid gut so this mid gut is supplied by the superior mesenteric artery so the lower half of the second part of the duodenum and the third part of the duodenum and the fourth part of the duodenum they are also innervated by the superior mesenteric artery right so here that's why it is showing some part of the uh, duodenum here the third part fourth part and the jejunum and ileum so these are all the structures that will be innervated by the uh, superior mesenteric artery now this is again next the blood supply to the large intestine the third part of the large intestine uh, uh, that relates with the uh, third blood supply the inferior mesenteric artery the inferior mesenteric artery it lasts from the distal or the last one third part of the transverse colon to the upper part of the anal canal right so if you see here this is the inferior mesenteric artery and it starts giving branch to the distal uh, one third of the transverse colon because it is cut down. So the transverse colon is the distal one third, right? The two third remaining that was supplied by the superior mesenteric artery. The distal one third of the transverse colon, and then the descending colon, and then the sigmoid colon, then the rectum, right? Till the upper part of the anal canal. They are all in a, uh, supplied blood supplied by the inferior mesenteric artery. Then we have got the inferior mesenteric artery about uh, the third point is related with the origin of the inferior mesenteric artery. So here this origin of the inferior mesenteric artery is just above the bifurcation of the abdominal aorta. So abdominal aorta usually bifurcates at uh, L4 or uh, L4 right and 3.8 centimeter above its bifurcation point uh, this artery arises so inferior mesenteric artery is 3.8 centimeter above the bifurcation point of the abdominal aorta so it terminates as the superior rectal artery so what is the last branch of the inferior uh, mesenteric artery this is the inferior last branch so this last branch is going where to the anus right so anus has got several uh, three uh, so superior artery superior branch is coming from the as the last branch of the inferior mesenteric artery the inferior mesenteric artery supplies the distal third of the transverse colon left colic flexure colic flexure what is this flexure means it derived from the flexion flexion means bending right when the degree between the two structures it is decreasing right so can you see here this is one transverse colon and descending colon here the bending is there so this bending is called flexures right since it is uh, in the colon so it is called colic flexures colic means related to the bending of the colon colic flexure and sometimes it is called as the splenic flexure in the colon and there is hepatic flexure on the right side then the descending colon, sigmoid colon, rectum and the upper half of the anal canal. So this artery, they go, it goes down to the anal canal also. It completely supplies the rectum and even the anal canal, that is the next part, on the upper area of the anal canal is also supplied by the last branch of the inferior mesenteric artery and the superior anal artery, superior rectal artery. So superior rectal artery is here, right? The lower part of the rectum and the anal canal is supplied by the middle and inferior rectal arteries. Superior 
rectal artery, middle rectal artery, and inferior rectal artery. Superior rectal artery is actually the last branch of the inferior mesenteric artery. Middle rectal artery, inferior rectal artery, these are the branch systemic branches from the hopefully pudendal arteries, right? So pudendal artery is one of the branch of the internal iliac artery. So internal iliac artery gives give one of the branch pudendal artery. Pudendal artery give branches to the middle and inferior part of the rectum called as the middle and inferior rectal artery. But the rectum also got the superior rectal artery but that superior rectal artery is actually a branch coming from the inferior mesenteric artery. Right? Now this is the uh, a slide regarding the portal venous drainage. <clears throat> First of all you should know that venous drainage from all the parts of the digestive system it ultimately go to the liver and through the vein that is called the portal vein right so this is the portal vein from here to here this is the portal vein and it is going to the liver so starting from here now the question arises which two tributaries unite together to form the portal vein so this is the portal vein is starting from here going into the liver and in the liver it divides into right and left portal branches right right hepatic vein left hepatic vein this portal vein is formed by the combination of this vein and this vein this vein is called as the splenic vein it is coming from the spleen right also take from the pancreas but the name of this one is very long one is splenic vein right this is and this inferior mesenteric vein also drain into the splenic vein right so this splenic vein also drain the pancreas and the inferior mesenteric vein also drain into the splenic vein and this vein is superior mesenteric vein so superior mesenteric vein and splenic vein these two these two combine to form the portal vein and portal vein ultimately drain into the vein, uh, liver and from the liver these vein venules they combine together to form the hepatic vein and hepatic vein then ultimately drain into the inferior vena cava now the venous blood from the greater part of the digestive system and the accessory organs drain to the liver by the portal venous system now what is portal vein drains blood from most of the git from lower third of the esophagus to the halfway down to the anal canal so from where to where actually it is draining from the mid gut uh, hind gut mid gut and fore gut so that's why it is saying it's a very large distribution so from the lower third of the esophagus up to the anal canal it also drains the spleen pancreas and the gallbladder the portal vein enters the liver and breaks up into sinusoids so what this portal vein come here and divide into right and left hepatic veins and these veins when they go into their respective lobes of the liver they form sinusoids means dilated capillaries right and where these blue uh, deoxygenated blood they are coming here so these are the hepatic sinusoids right they convert to form the hepatic vein that ultimately drain into the inferior vena cava the portal vein enters the liver breaks up into sinusoids from the blood passes from which the blood passes into the hepatic vein that join the inferior vena cava right so in hepatic vein join the inferior vena cava tributaries of the portal vein tributaries of the portal vein are the splenic vein superior mesenteric vein left gastric vein right gastric vein cystic vein so portal vein from here to here now here it is asking giving the tributaries means the branches in artery we say branches but for venous system we say those branches as tributaries so this is the tributary right the gastric so superior mesenteric vein left gastric vein this is the left gastric vein right then we have got the right gastric vein the right gastric vein we have got the right gastric vein left gastric vein these two then we have got the cystic vein cystic vein is here this is the gallbladder the neck of the gallbladder and there's the cystic duct so there's the cystic vein so these are the tributaries upper third uh, two third of the esophagus drain into the esophagus vein systemic circulation now above this one for the esophagus 
the we divide the esophagus into upper, middle, and lower one third. The lower one third arterial supply was the esophageal branches from the left gastric artery, and the venous drainage of the lower one third is through the esophageal veins that are the tributaries of the left gastric vein, right? But these veins they will go and the part of the portal veins, right? So portal veins they are indirect veins. They are not going to the heart. They are, they are supplying to the liver, right? And the for the esophagus middle part and the upper part of the esophagus, they are supplied by the esophagus vein, the venous drainage of the middle part and the upper part of the esophagus. It is through the esophagus vein, and esophagus vein is a part of the systemic circulation. It is not the part of the portal circulation. Portal circulation related with the portal vein, right? So here there is a junction in the esophagus between the part upper two third. And the lower one third, lower one third, the venous drainage is going to the portal system, and the upper two third of the esophagus, it is actually the venous blood is going to the systemic circulation through the esophagus vein, right? So here there is a junction that anastomosis. So that anastomosis is called the porto systemic anastomosis. So lower half of the anal canal, the same anastomosis between portal and systemic venous blood is also there in the anal canal. that is drained by the middle and inferior rectal veins now middle and inferior rectal vein i told you just like the artery these are the tributaries of the portal of the uh, pudendal vein right so pudendal vein is a branch from the internal iliac vein right so these veins these are the systemic veins going there to the heart right but the rectum the superior rectal vein superior rectal vein is this one it is a tributary of the inferior mesenteric just like in the artery superior rectal artery the last branch of the inferior mesenteric artery so the last branch of the inferior mesenteric vein is the superior middle superior rectal vein so this superior rectal vein is draining the deoxygenated blood from the rectum into the portal vein and so this rectum has also got an anastomosis porto systemic anastomosis between the upper one part the first upper one third and the lower two third of the rectum that was supplied by the middle rectal vein and the inferior rectal vein those were the branches of the pudendal vein the systemic vein right so systemic portal anastomosis is also present in the rectum thank you very much alhamdulillah